Welcome everyone, I'm Ron Hawkins with uh, SDSC and welcome to our September Tech Forum event. Uh, those of you who've joined us the last few months are used to hearing me say we normally do these as a breakfast, but uh, I think now that we're six months into this, we normally do it as a Zoom and uh, we'll dispense with apologizing for not being able to feed you breakfast and uh, well, We'll talk to you about that again sometime in 2021. But the silver lining of that is we've been able to connect with a lot of folks who uh, wouldn't join us for a local breakfast. So we'll we'll take the, the glass half full uh, view of things and, and, and move on. So our uh, tech forum events are uh, something we do as part of our industrial outreach program and we variously feature speakers from UCSD, from SDSC, and, and industry. And uh, this month, uh, we have another industry uh, presentation, uh, local, uh, local startup, Kazoom. And uh, it's always nice to be engaged with, uh, with San Diego startups and uh, see the, uh, the innovation and the, the business formation that coming out of the, the San Diego uh, economic machine. So, that's great. Now, um, at SDSC, the, the, the usual discussion is how do we pack more computing and storage power into our already uh, pretty full data center. And uh, of late, it's been also how do we remove all the, the heat generated by that equipment. And, and this summer, uh, part of that has involved implementing direct-to-chip liquid cooling with our new Expanse supercomputer. And so that's a new territory for us, a new capability, and uh, hopefully positioning us well for the future. But uh, Kazoom's got a, a different take on the, on the matter, and, and uh, they're more about uh, marshalling up uh, resources that are scattered outside the data center into a high-performance computing resource. And we have, uh, We've seen some uh, some efforts like that in the past, but uh, Kazoom has a different take. They have uh, some new innovations, some new technology, and so we look forward to uh, having them tell us about that. I am supposed to remind you, if you haven't realized it already, uh, that uh, the meeting is being recorded. And normally what we do is, is run the court recording up to the Q&A session and then uh, secure the recording so uh, you have an opportunity to ask questions um, that you may not uh, care to have on the record. Um, now, if you if you do choose to pose a question during the course of the the actual presentation, then just be advised uh, that that will um, end up on the recording. So let's see. Before I hand it off to uh, Josh Jacobson and, and Dan Kepner from Kazoom, I'll check with Cindy and see if I've forgotten anything. No, I think you're good. Okay, then with, uh, without further ado, um, I will turn it over to, I think, Dan first. Thank you, Dan. That's right. All right, well, thanks everyone for attending. Um, myself and uh, Josh Jacobson are uh, from Kazoom. And uh, so for today's tech exchange, we'll be covering uh, the concept that uh, Ron brought up at a high level. Then we'll also talk to a couple of use cases that we think will apply to this audience. Uh, and then Josh will get into a technical discussion. Uh, and if there's time, we'll do a demo at the end. Otherwise, we'll, we'll share a video with you. Um, and what we'd like you to get out of this is a better understanding of how a heterogeneous compute environment, like what you might see on a college campus, could help complement uh, more purpose-built systems like high-performance computers. Uh, and of course, feel free to, to stop us to ask any questions at any time. Um, so the premise for Kazoo uh, revolves around helping companies and universities maximize the compute that they already have. Uh, and what we found in our research is that laptops and desktops typically sit idle about 70% of the day. So this is overnight, during lunchtime, just during other times that, that people aren't, aren't actually using their, their desktops or laptops actively. And then of course, many on campus hosted servers 
aren't always operated at full capacity either, especially if the university has gone to the cloud. And then of course, IoT and smaller devices that may be used for research also have spare compute cycles. So in summary, the, the challenge that we're focused on for this discussion is how can existing university compute help an HPC center to process more data? Uh, and specifically here, we mean data and compute that does not necessarily require a supercomputer. Um, and so the purpose of this is to address uh, a massively growing market for the type of machine learning and AI research compute uh, that you might see in a supercomputer. And, you know, we're seeing a compound annual growth rate of 42% for the next uh, four years for machine learning and AI needs. Um, and of course, also to help the uh, costly cloud bills that can be certainly unpredictable, especially after, you know, free credits offered by big cloud providers run out. Uh, and so certainly with educational uh, budgets shrinking due to COVID, we think that this type of question is one that should be uh, addressed in a timely manner. So the solution that we're going to be discussing today in detail um, is all around uh, on-demand compute for any type of analytics, AI, machine learning, research, or even content prep workflows. And doing this on-demand compute using compute assets that the university already owns. Uh, so what essentially we did is we have the ability to create your own private cloud-like compute and storage fabric, but using compute uh, equipment that already exists on campus. So desktops, servers, um, even student computers that may have available compute cycles. All of this compute is intended to live within uh, a given network in a spin-up, spin-down model. Uh, and what we're providing is what we call a secondary use for compute assets that is decentralized. And Josh will talk a little bit more about what we mean by secondary use shortly. Um, and then doing all of this in a manner that's very easy to set up and manage uh, for supporting the HPC or even for edge and IoT use cases. So think of this as, as a modern take on some of the concepts of grid compute but enabled by containerization technology. So we see university-based HPC and this heterogeneous compute technology that we're discussing um, is two different types of distributed compute, but two types of distributed compute that work extremely well together. So uh, Kazoom itself is not a supercomputer. Um, we don't have the connectivity or the IO that comes with uh, you know, being a high power system like the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Um, so what we'll do just to compare the roles of each and how they complement each other, uh, we'll go over a couple of different attributes. So for example, an HP Center uh, is typically designed to run heavy scientific compute on purpose-built compute infrastructure, uh, whereas Kazoom is designed to be run on commodity or common resources that you may find on a campus. Uh, an HPC center is typically centrally managed or governed, uh, could be by an internal board or an external agency if it's government funded. Uh, whereas the system we're discussing today is designed to be provisioned and managed by individuals or departments. Um, many HPCs uh, are homogeneous or are close to homogeneous. Uh, while this compute system is designed to be heterogeneous and that it can run across operating systems, so Mac, Windows, and Linux, um, or it can run across various device types, such as desktops, laptops, servers, uh, IoT devices, and other hardware, um, and even across different chipsets like ARM and x86. Um, many HPCs are uh, centrally located just because of the size. Um, uh, our system is designed to run in a decentralized environment so it can support edge use cases or IoT use cases. Um, and finally, uh, many of the HPCs uh, tend to be prior, uh, priority or time-based um, so that there's a certain amount of time that individuals can use the system. Uh, while our system is designed to be run as needed and can be dedicated to individuals or departments. So two different technologies, but highly complementary, and they, they work very well together. Uh, so in summary, while the HP 
HPC will have a tremendous amount of compute and storage that will greatly exceed on-campus resources. We believe there is uh, definitely value in unifying the available assets that are there. Sorry, I just lost my screen. Apologize for the delay, just one second while my computer comes back up. Can everyone still see the screen? Yes. No, not anymore. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay, how about now? No, it's loading right now, I think. Okay. Oh, there, there it is. Okay, great. Um, so in summary, yes, while the HPC will have a tremendous amount of compute and storage that will greatly exceed uh, on-campus resources, um, you know, we believe there's value in unifying the available compute and storage that already exists at the university in a slightly different model uh, to complement a variety of use cases that we're about to discuss. And this on-campus compute that we're talking about would include labs, uh, campus data centers, student compute assets, uh, even hardware or IoT devices. So unifying this all together to complement the HPC. Um, so there's several use cases that are uh, peripheral compute technology that could be supported along a uh, HPC. Um, so the first use case is uh, a sandbox that could live outside of an HPC and could be used to develop and test models in what you could consider a safe and repeatable manner. They could encourage uh, a collaboration with multiple partners. Uh, and then you could move the finished solution or the final models into more of an HPC-based solution. Um, the second use case around this space is all around content preparation and uh, ETL. So with uh, massive data growth expected each year, uh, it's really critical to have a means for paired data for analytics, to prepare data for simulation, to prepare data for available spin up, spin down compute. Um, now the third case here is gonna be around edge and IoT. Um, so since HPCs tend to be more centralized, uh, you can utilize a compute environment technology uh, to perform compute where the data is actually generated. So this would inc include uh, edge use cases such as smart cities, uh, industrial IoT, augmented reality, and drones. So really supporting the decentralized compute model. And then finally, the, the use case for research. Um, you can use this on-demand compute to make available to researchers. Um, in a way that doesn't involve uh, heavy cloud spend and that can be used on demand. Um, and so that these compute assets can be dedicated or they can be shared among the various researchers. Um, and we're doing actually quite a bit of work in this area with various researchers around the world supporting genomics, uh, smart cities and analytics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and so some of the projects that we're doing right now, um, we've got a video trans coding project that uses uh, underutilized servers uh, overseas in lieu of a cloud spend. Um, we are supporting a major uh, cable and internet provider as a edge compute enablement technology. Uh, we have a smart cities project that we're starting now um, that's doing computer vision that's unifying uh, processing across campus. Um, we did an AI and machine learning model that helped uh, distribute TensorFlow across commodity assets. Uh, we've got a project going right now with a semiconductor manufacturer um, that's designed to do memory optimization on employee resources. 
Um, we've got a genomics research project uh, that does distributed compute for population genomics. And we're actually running our software embedded in a flash storage array device. Um, they can activate all of the assets, uh, all of the desktops and laptop assets that are on the network as that flash storage array. Um, so with that, I will hand off the presentation to Josh to talk about uh, some more of the uh, technical aspects of the solution we put together. Hello, uh, I'm Josh. Uh, thanks again for having us, everybody. Um, so I'll jump right in. Um, Obviously, from this slide, you can see that Docker is the container runtime that we use, uh, not so under the hood. Um, and why containers uh, is a good question um, to me. So comparing um, containers to VMs, or even in some sense, uh, compared to traditional um, software deployment mechanisms, um, containers are lightweight, easy to distribute. Um, we have found great support for cross-compilation and multi-architecture distribution. Um, and um, Docker is great for us because it has a distribution mechanism that's included right alongside the runtime. Um, that's pulling and pushing images to Docker repositories, of course, um, which also solves the need for an artifact repository in build and deploy pipelines. Um, so Build and push is a little bit easier to pipeline since some of the tools are built right in. Um, and there is probably a whole nother series of talks on why containerization makes sense and is a great technology. So I'll end my lauding of the technology there. Um, we also um, would consider ourselves a little bit more of a general purpose platform than what we consider like a traditional grid or job or batch based system. Um, in the interest of staying more general purpose, uh, one of our design goals was to um, not have to manage any language specific bindings uh, in order to utilize our technology. Um, so containers help us do that, of course, since the, the binary and all of its um, dependencies are packaged and distributed as a whole. Um, which means that uh, you as the application developer don't actually need to um, come in and there's no, there's no such thing as a code compiled for Kazoom. It's just, it's an application. It just happens to run on us. Um, we support um, a couple of different um, deployment models, which include Docker Compose file support in the platform. Um, we've put some extensions on top of the standard Docker Compose YAML format um, so that folks can come in, take what they have, um, Kazoomify it a little bit, uh, but not in a way that um, would prevent them from testing it locally or running it on any other Docker Compose provider. Um, internally, we translate that down into our own placement engine and then run the container placement uh, and lifecycle management um, in platform. Um, so this supports a good number of deployment and software architecture models, um, as opposed to, again, a more traditional um, batch-based, um, or um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the volunteer compute model um, of SETI at home. If everybody had a SETI at home problem, um, all of our jobs would be a lot easier, right? Um, so I would like to go ahead and describe some of the platform architecture. Um, Dan, can you go ahead and, um, thanks. Um, so we've been talking about the type of host or uh, compute asset that can be utilized by our platform. Um, taking the availability constraints of a typical Kazoom host into account, um, it's important for us to think about how to create what looks and feels as close to a traditional, in quotes, infrastructure as possible, um, or better yet, uh, as, close to, as close as necessary uh, if you will, um, to service the requirements of any particular application that runs on it. Um, so uh, with what we're calling secondary use devices, there's obviously times when um, 
that primary use is going to be more important. There's, of course, if we're on laptops, there's going to be time when the lid is closed. Um, and these, um, these availability constraints um, make it very difficult, of course, to think about it in terms of like server room gear um, or talking number of nines of uptime, et cetera. Um, so how do we, how do we take these, what, what I'd consider low availability devices and turn it into a infrastructure that you wouldn't mind running a higher available software on? Um, and we use our portal as the high availability component there. Um, so the portal is installed. Um, it can be hosted in the cloud. Uh, it can be hosted um, on a client's premise uh, in a VM appliance. Um, and the portal is where uh, all the user interaction with the platform happens. Um, and then there's some other centralized components there, um, intelligence services. Um, there's a shared storage layer, um, as well as the distributed compute engine, which I'll talk about um, in a little bit. Um, from the portal, uh, the user logs into a web interface um, and can get into the host management section. Um, we have everybody download our host agent, which is a lightweight host native binary. Um, and so that's, as Dan mentioned, Windows, Mac, Linux uh, on x86 or ARM. Um, and then inside of ARM, we support ARM 64v8, ARM v7, and ARM v5 um, nowadays. Uh, the host agent runs as a system service, and it's mainly responsible for host monitoring and state management of that host, so all the command and control stuff. Um, we go one level up into host groups, um, which are our virtual organizations. Um, and then, as you'll see um, coming up shortly, uh, the host group is also where we can apply some group-level controls. Uh, around um, availability and resource usage. Um, sorry. <laughs> and then um, on top of host groups, we have what's what we call projects. The project is where you actually deploy an application into, and an application can run on more than one host group if you decide to recruit more than one host group for that application. Um, Last but not least, I would like to spend just a sec talking about what's not drawn on this slide, which is storage. Um, storage is everywhere. If we tried to draw storage into the slide, there would literally be storage boxes all over the place. So on platform and off platform, local, share, local storage on the individual compute nodes, shared storage, cloud storage, temporary storage for inside of a running job. Um, and in most cases, it's some or all of the above. Um, is required to actually get a, an, an event through um, a pipeline and out the other end. Um, we like to consider data gravity, and we also like to operate in the model of compute follow storage, um, which is why we can shift our logical organizations around with regard to which host groups are participating in a project um, or where a node lives. Um, and we can do that provisioning either locally uh, on, of course, as we mentioned, devices that you own, or we can provision into um, the big three um, cloud providers um, if data lives there and you want to go compute in those um, platforms. Um, so Dan, go ahead and, uh, and um, advance me, please. Um, coming back around, um, based on the needs of the application, our networking model can be either simple or a little bit more complex. Um, all of the nodes need to have ability to communicate with Portal, um, but obviously, maybe not obviously, Portal may not have the ability to communicate back to any of the nodes themselves um, if they're behind a corporate firewall or on a different um, network that doesn't allow inbound traffic, um, et cetera. Um, so we have to consider portal as kind of the routing station for all of this stuff. Um, we have implemented where required a VPN based overlay network. Um, and then also inside of portal, we are, um, keeping track of a global graph of all nodes that are in management and who can see 
who, and as we create these host groups and choose host group masters for them, those masters can also become the aggregation point um, of, the, of the global network routing, um, which again goes up through portal. Um, and one important thing to note is that um, obviously in this diagram, portal becomes a hub and spoke component. The services and various components that are running inside of our portal are also themselves containerized and therefore can be distributed as necessary um, later on um, if performance or availability bottlenecks arise. Um, so based on the way that we have networking set up in one or more of these um, kind of local or global models, and again, that's dependent on whether the app needs communication between the nodes um, or if everything can, or if everything doesn't need to communicate with each other, it can communicate with something centralized. Um, the applications can again interact with storage platforms as necessary. Um, storage, in fact, can even be deployed as an application running on the Kazumified nodes themselves. Um, so a little bit of hyperconvergence, if you will, storage and application can live in that same set of compute there. Uh, our portal also includes an S3 compatible storage service, um, which we use as temporary storage for, um, for some of our distributed compute engine jobs, which I'll talk about in just a sec. Um, due to the fact that we control both container placement and uh, workload execution, um, we can put intelligence on both sides of that equation. And the way that we do that is um, the ideal way that we do that is with our distributed compute engine. It's a, um, it's not too fancy of a directed acyclic graph workflow engine. Um, it is extensible uh, in that the workflows themselves are represented in TypeScript. Um, so there's a template and if you need more than, uh, what's, what, than, than what's available in a simple DAG, um, that's something you can code in if you'd like. Um, the way that we um, consider our distributed compute engine uh, at runtime is um, it's, it's all event-based. The events um, work as a set of requirements. The workers will present a set of capabilities. DCE will match those capabilities um, and then generate new requirements based on which step of the DAG it's at. Um, so pretty straightforward. Um, the Kazoom interesting bits of that is that the DCE agent we have implemented uh, in the base layer of a container um, and that's all written for you. So instead of a language specific binding, um, you as the application developer simply create a manifest file that maps those event types to the handlers that you um, build into the container. Um, this way, we are able to have folks write their own software, bring their own software that's already written, uh, or containerize a third-party tool uh, or library um, if the software that needs to be run is distributed that way. Um, this gives us a built-in way to opportunistically utilize pretty much any and all available compute, um, because if a node is no longer connected, the DCE will drop it out of the running for any um, um, further event processing. And uh, each event comes with its own built-in timeouts. So if a node goes offline during execution, um, that uh, event is just reassigned to a different node. Um, of course, um, it would be great if everybody used our distributed compute engine, but um, this is also, um, when we talk about opportunistic, opportunistically utilizing compute, um, you can also think of this in comparison to a um, containerized functions as a service or um, components of a streaming processing system um, where each one of the events is individually serviced um, and the individual compute nodes that are participating in it um, are hopefully guaranteed some small level of availability during that processing window uh, of the individual events. Um, instead of considering 
like long running services um, or highly available services. Um, so I will go ahead and end with a little summary of um, when we talk about secondary use workloads, um, what do we really mean? Um, and maybe this is obvious, um, desktops, laptops, et cetera, all have a primary purpose. Um, and it's not generally participating in compute um, for, <clears throat> uh, for a distributed application. It's for me to check my email or browse web or participate in a Zoom, uh, which by the way, uh, is taking up about 15% of my uh, Mac laptop here, which is otherwise um, unused uh, and hungry for something to run on it. And that's where we come in. Um, so in order to make sure that we prioritize these primary use uh, workloads or these primary uses of the devices, we have a couple of controls in place. Um, and those are availability scheduling, pardon me, and resource control. So um, scheduling, not what you would consider the term scheduling to mean traditionally in HPC. Um, this is a simple availability window that we can set on a host that says um, finance department is running reports from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Don't run anything auxiliary on their computers because their usage will spike. Um, and that's settable at the individual node level or at the host group level. Um, and then resource control, we can limit the amount of a computer that we consume. So if I have a six core laptop, I can say only use two cores for Kazoom or only give me four megabytes, four gigabytes of memory, um, et cetera. Um, and then host agent between portal and host agent will control that usage. And if there's running containers, when a device goes out of an availability window, um, then those containers will get shut down uh, and a computer can go back to its primary use. Um, based on the um, amount of control that we're uh, able to exert and the reporting that we get back from our host agents. Um, this allows us to collect metrics around, of course, node availability, um, regardless of whether it's scheduled availability or not, um, and actual resource utilization to compare to uh, limited utilization. Um, and this information, of course, will all feed back into platform intelligence. Um, so that's the end of my little whirlwind. Um, and I Great, will thank you, Josh. To Dan. Okay, what we're going to do, we're, we'll do a quick pause on the uh, uh, on the questions, and, and we're going to jump over just to the demo quickly, just to get you guys a quick look at uh, at how the uh, software uh, actually looks and functions. Just one second. We've got about uh, about ten minutes here, so I will go uh, a little faster than uh, than normal. Um, everybody see the screen? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what you're looking at what you're looking at here is the Kazoom dashboard. So after signing into an account, you would arrive at, at this page. Um, in the context of a customer project, there would be two interfaces that they could work with. So you would have uh, a native um, interface to the application itself. If you use like an AI or machine learning application, you may have a command prompt for that, whatever the native uh, way to access that system is. And then if you'd like to provide them access, you would have um, this management interface as well uh, to deploy and manage the application. Um, so as Josh mentioned, the the general flow is very simple. Um, you'd add a compute node. It could be on-prem, can be cloud, etc. cetera. Uh, you group the compute nodes together into a host group that you would want to run an application on. And then you would actually deploy the application on the compute nodes. Um, so from this screen, you can see how many connected hosts or how many computers you have connected. Uh, and you can see how many total GPU, sorry, CPUs, GPUs, and memory you have available and how much of each is being used. So under host management, um, 
this will show you um, which nodes or compute resources you have uh, connected across campus to be used here. So these could be server hosts, this could be desktops, really any compute you want to make available. Um, in this case, we've got you know, a, a fairly eclectic mix of resources represent what you might have on campus. We've got Windows desktops, we've got server VMs, we've got Amazon nodes, we've got Macs. Um, if you wanted to add a new host or say you wanted to add a couple of computers that sit in a lab, uh, you'd hit the add host button. Um, and here you'd see the wide variety of options of the types of hosts you can add. Uh, you can add hosts to run on bare metal or VMware enabled systems, uh, Mac, Windows, Linux. Um, you can run on x86 and ARM. Uh, you can even deploy to any of the major cloud nodes. Uh, so what you do, um, if you wanted to activate a new device, and I won't do it just in the interest of time, you'd hit add host, it would get you the, the binary to put on the various workstations, and then you'd see the node just pop up right here. Um, so the next thing that we'll do, um, we will connect a group of compute resources to work on a particular application. Um, and what this does is this allows you to dedicate certain compute nodes to certain applications. So just like the cloud, it's, it's very flexible. You can add or remove nodes uh, as you see fit. Um, so let's say we want to create a small group of computers together to help with uh, processing some video. What I'll do is I'll just create a host group. And I will use Kazoom Container Orchestration. Um, it's going to ask me which master node uh, to work with. I will pick. Uh, a VM uh, that we've got running. Assume that this is something running in a data center uh, at a university. Uh, um, and then I'll have a series of worker nodes that I can add. Um, to make it interesting, I'll do a mix of Linux and Windows machines. And so let me jump, jump around. Here's a Windows machine. And here are a couple of uh, Linux machines that we can use. And what I'll do is I'll create the host group. Um, and at this point, uh, we now actually have uh, the host group put together. So the last step here is to choose which application we would like to run on the host group. So this sits underneath projects. So if we go to the projects list, we can create a new project. I will call it San Diego Supercomputer Center Demo. Uh, it'll ask me which host group I want to run it on. Um, I've got that host group I just created uh, a couple seconds ago with three hosts, and eight CPUs, and about 16 gigs of memory. Um, and then as you go to add an application, you have a couple of different options. Uh, you can select a Docker Compose file, um, you know, just a standard uh, Docker Compose file that would be one of the hundreds of thousands of uh, images you can get uh, on Docker Hub. Um, you can also alternatively, uh, you can deploy uh, an existing application that maybe you, you have created natively. Uh, because we talked about video processing, I will show deployment of a transcoding application across those resources. So I will quickly kick the job off for you just to show uh, the actual job running and the impact that it has. I selected a video to run through the system. And just like that, uh, we've now um, added a couple of nodes, grouped them together, and deployed an application on it. And right now, the application is running in a heterogeneous set of resources that could represent what you have on a campus, running in a distributed video processing job. Um, the job will just take a, a minute or two to run. Um, so in the interest of time, we'll be happy to uh, get back to some of the, the questions. Um, any questions about the demo uh, that you've seen or um, you know, any feedback that you have on any of the concepts that uh, we presented today? Yeah, and I think I saw a new question come up in the uh, chat window there.
Uh, so yeah, good question. Um, so compute in memory seems to be a big focus for AI and machine learning workloads these days. Uh, any integration for this sort of technology yet? Josh, you want to talk about plans around that? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, to me, that's an application specific question. So we would certainly support um, the aggregation of a bunch of host memories um, in order to service a, an, an in-memory compute application. Um, in fact, um, going back to um, a previous question about ideal workloads and less ideal workloads, um, any, any application that doesn't have a persistent local state um, is better. Um, if the, again, back to the laptop example, lid on my laptop closes um, and some local state is to be there that's not any longer, because that node is off the network, that's a problem. Um, so compute is actually a great model for us um, in that in that aspect. In that. Great. Well, uh, I, I think we're getting up towards the the top of the uh, hour there. So I want to want to thank Dan and, and Josh and the whole uh, Kazoom team and commend their bravery to do a live demo uh, for, for the Zoom audience. Um, wish you guys uh, a lot of luck and uh, hope, hope folks who are interested would, uh, would reach out uh, directly uh, to Josh if you, if you have further questions or interests. Um, do want to note uh, for the folks that are still on that our next uh, Tech Forum event is October 7th and we have Bright Computing uh, presenting and, and uh, Bright Right is really uh, raising the bar on how you manage, uh, provision, control, HPC resources, and, and integrate with the cloud. So, um, you know, if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, please please join us and and uh, you know hear about what they're doing and, and their latest technology and and features uh, in their uh, in their products. So, um, with that, I think we will. Uh, adjourn for today and, and once again thanks everyone and, and look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you. Nice to meet everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you.